Marvin Ong is a poi spinner, club juggler, and an overall legend in the poi community. It's been an absolute honor to have him on for the second episode of our podcast. Typically, we want to keep these episodes around 45 minutes, but again, this one was just so much fun and we had a lot to talk about. So welcome to the podcast and enjoy the episode, everybody. Thanks. What's up, Marvin? What's up? Thanks so much for doing this episode with me, man. I'm really excited to talk to you. This has been a long and waited episode for me, for sure. Um, let's go back to the very beginning for everybody at home. Uh, when did you first get introduced to Flow Arts and what was your first prop? I got started in like 2007 uh, at the first EDC in LA. And uh, glow stringing was kind of like uh, how I ended up becoming my first prop. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's how I started. Like now, it's coming up sixteen years. Yeah, a long time. It's funny that most people's introduction to poi, especially in the U.S., is typically glow stringing. That's kind of what I'm finding, especially yeah. the people that started around that era. I think it has to do with like the move, like the like EDM movement of the '90s. You know, like and I feel like that was like picking up with like technology, and I feel like it just kind of like makes sense. You know, like it like. Cause it was like a boom and it was kind of getting more popular. And I think a lot of people started from that. If you For start sure, from yeah. that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how long until you had started glow stringing uh, that you saw Poi? How long do you think that period of time was? I think right from the beginning I saw Poi. Uh, maybe because like how, how it started is because I was at ADC in at the Coliseum and my buddy like had me to had me to hand him hand me a pair of glow sticks with no shoelaces on just like mm -hmm. a pair of glow sticks. And he was like, Oh yeah, do this like figure eight thing. And I've, I've gone to raves for years at that time. Like I've been to like a lot of massives and, you know, mm -hmm. I, I always go to the front and kind of like just do my own thing and dance and stuff like that. And, um, I've always seen the glow stickers. I just never paid attention to them. Like most people, I think like right. I think you just kind of like walk past them. You're like, you never really thought much about it. And, and what happened was uh, after he gave me those sticks, like I, I tried to like do it at that event and I couldn't do it. And I was kind of like pretty upset. And then I went home <laughs> and, and I look up YouTube. I was like, just look up glow sticking. And YouTube was just starting it at that time, like 2007. Right. And then a bunch of glow sticking videos popped up. And the, there was this one video. I think the guy passed away. His name is a Stinko Witch. S-T-I-N-K-O-W-I-C-Z. It's like from glowsticking.com. Mm -hmm. And then I found glowstringing.com and then I started glow stringing. And then I saw Poi maybe, I don't know, a couple months after or something. But at that time, I think Poi wasn't as technical. It was just kind of like weaves and people do fire. And mm -hmm. and I had this conversation with uh, Cassandra from Flowfest. Uh, and I was like, I feel like most people that I know... Um, when they see fire spinning, they're like, oh, fire spinning, I want to spin fire. And they're, that's 95% or maybe more of how people got started with spinning. For me, I saw the fire spinning and I wasn't impressed. As a newbie, as a beginner, I wasn't <laughs> impressed. I was like, oh, why would I want to spin weaves in a circle for five minutes when I can do 50 tricks over here with glow stringing? Right. I, I talked to Cassandra. I was like, even as a beginner, I already had that eye to see that and i was like, i wonder why that is and then he was she was like because you have like a obsessive kind of like personality and that's basically it so like when i get into something i get really deep into it i feel so the like, exact same so right from the beginning i was able to see the difference between poi and glow stringing and i wasn't impressed so i didn't really want to spin poi and i was like i didn't really care and i was kind of confused if, like why, why people spin poi <laughs> And, uh, I love that. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. amazing. So that was like, kind of like the beginning for me with uh, the entrance to Poi. And then then it kind of like changed in like, a, like two years after. Interesting. Yeah, and you know, like what you were talking about when you're passing by and you just notice the glow stringers, but you didn't really pay them much mind. You mm -hmm. had no idea how much it would shape the rest of your life at that time. Totally. It's just funny. Yeah, that, yeah. For sure, for sure. And I, I think like the other part that was funny was also like after i start picking it up you all of a sudden realize that sometimes your surroundings you just should pay more attention and ask more questions and i think that is the thing i think a lot of people lack 
a lot of people are kind of like just going through life kind of like just and I'm, i i used to be like that you know what i mean like just going through life just like kind of like this just like this and then all of a sudden the the the, the sides comes down and you're like why why how you just keep asking questions mm-hmm. and i think like mm-hmm. that's kind of like a a nicer way to kind of like experience things so it's interesting that you have that take on firepoy or had that take initially on firepoy because mm-hmm. you actually happen to have one of the most viewed firepoy videos of all time so <laughs> let's let's talk about that um that when video? that yeah when that yeah. video was recorded how long had you been spinning uh poi at that time do you remember uh yeah i remember because uh i started with glow stringing so i, sp- I spun glow like glow sticks for like two years and then 2009 mm-hmm. contact poi started becoming a thing by uh rodin and i saw mm-hmm. a video of it and then i went to my first fire drums and burning man 2010 and at burning man and fire drums i was like so blown away by the skill and openness of the community i want to really like dive deeper into it and really it's very of- accepting devote my life to it i i, I knew mm-hmm. at that time i was like you know i'm gonna just commit to this and i don't know how far it'll go but we'll see and then in 2011 and 12 i started getting flown out to places to teach uh, workshops and stuff so cool and this was my first time in portland uh 11 years ago 2012 and i went to reed college and reed college if you have never been to portland portland like this i keep portland weird portland is like mm-hmm. so weird <laughs> extremely yeah and they have a, a huge juggling and fire spinning um culture in portland and um i went to reed college and they had like a fire spinning club and and it were all like newbies everybody's like really new and they were like kind of like helping each other it was really cute and so i was like oh, i'm gonna go up and spin and i picked like one song and i spun and at that time i think i was already spinning poi like three years and then two years with glow stringing and then three years wow. with poi and um that's extremely impressive for me not even just because you're that good um three years in but more so for that time period especially three years in for you to yeah. already have that level of control um it was very odd for someone to already be that good so i think that's kind of the reason why this video blew up in a lot of ways is because your attention to detail with shapes and your control with speed and just the overall placements with your pedals. There was not a lot of people doing it like that back then. Pretty much nobody. Yeah. And, and after I spun, I, I felt like it was okay. It wasn't like that great <laughs> of a spin, you know, like, cause usually when, I, uh, usually when I finish spinning, I usually grade myself out of 10. Yeah. Was that like a six or maybe like in a seven? And usually, I, I, it's really rare I hit that hit an eight. Never had, never a ten, never a nine. Usually, if I hit an eight, it's really high. I think I felt like a six and a half, maybe. And then the guy messaged me, said, oh, "I got a video of it," and he was like, "I can send it to you." I was like, "Yeah, sure." He he, he sent it to me, <laughs> and I was like, "I wonder if I even want to upload this." I was like, mm, "It's not that great, whatever." And then like I uploaded, it and uh, it's like one of my most popular videos out there. And till today, till today, like. 15 years later i'll be at like some random event and this random kid will be like yo i started spinning (laughs) because of you because of that video just so you know isn't that so cool (laughs) it's super cool it's super cool that is awesome you had no idea that i mean of course while you're doing the burn and even leading up to you releasing the video you just had no idea that it would um have such reach so what was Did you notice a difference after that video came out and kind of like gained popularity, like going to flow arts festivals or events? You had people pretty much initially coming up to you, recognize you from that video. I mean, I would assume. Uh, What was strange is 2012 was like a really special year. It was the year that I went full time with the craft. It was the year that I started the prop shop and um, it was the year that like the name Master Ong came to be and and I think it was like at Burning Man, um, and somebody walked up to me, and it was like first time somebody was like, "Hey, you're Master Ong," and I was like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure that was so weird. And then later on, it like kept it kept happening, and it'll be like in the craziest place will be like I'm in an Uber in LA, somebody recognized me. Oh, you're from your Grandmaster Ong, or like I'm in a train in London, um, people recognize me wow. in, in the streets in Berlin. It was 
that's like the more extreme versions, but it, you know, because the wild thing about the internet is it no longer like community is no longer based on your geographical location, but it's more so of what you're into. So it kind of broadens what we have reach to and the different people that we connect with on an international level. For sure. The internet definitely has created like pods of like sub communities through like technology in the last like 20 30 years for sure a thousand percent so interesting yeah and just going back to that video and kind of you saying that you had somebody come up to you and it was said that they started spinning fire because of you or because of that video it's still such a trip for me to be able to be on a podcast with you and like even consider you to be a friend because you were a major influence for myself and my brother and um just during that time period in my life, I was learning and there was still so much to learn. And there is now still, but I was very much so in the fundamentals. And I feel like you had incredible fundamentals. So you were definitely somebody that I looked up to and that we had watched that video so many times. So it's really cool Thanks. to be able to connect with you finally. You know, it's awesome. Probably you guys gave it a couple thousand hits. <laughs> no, seriously, over the years or me just telling somebody to watch the video um or yeah we just running youtube all the time because that's all there was back then yeah um for me and my brother and you know the people in salt lake where i grew up we kind of only had each other in the internet mm. so it was just mainly of seeing what other people are doing and yeah that video is extremely popular and um yeah i just never envisioned myself being on a podcast with the man behind the video <laughs> so cool <laughs> um so let's let's get on here. I have a couple more questions for you. So once you got started spinning poi um, around that time period, who were the artists that you really looked up to and took inspiration from during that era of your life? For sure. One of my biggest and main inspiration definitely is Ronan uh, from Ireland, Ronan mm -hmm. McClellan. And I've met him. I, I got to hang out with him multiple times. He's an amazing human being. He was like the one of the first to like start exploring like contact poi. So he, he was like my main. And my poi teachers before that was Alien John and Burning Dan. That's how I got into like spinning poi because I met Alien John and Alien John just like broke my brain and really <laughs> like showed me like like kind of like the um, the technical abilities of like poi spinning. Alien John was my teacher, Burning Dan, Ronan. I really, I was like really like uh, inspired by G as well. G was like the first person in like 2012 to start like plane breaking. Mm -hmm. and yeah, Exploring more like, 3D types mm -hmm. type ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think those are like the few that I can like like recall top of my head. You no, know, like, it's interesting like, that those people were spearheading a lot of the early um, exploration of those ideas during that time because I would say my contact poi journey probably started a year after that mm -hmm. probably around 2013 2014 and what was becoming more popular on a mainstream level in the poi community obviously yeah. because poi is very not mainstream but within the poi community people started doing contact more frequently and it was kind of a more often seen thing so it's really interesting the way that contact poi was birthed in a lot of ways and popularized you know for sure probably mainly by uh ronan i would say mm -hmm. because like you said he was kind of exploring the early ideas oh, yeah, of and contact keith boy keith marshall too i was like really inspired by keith and keith was juggling poi back then wasn't he so keith i feel was pretty interesting keith is from uh scotland I think I mm -hmm. and, and he learned from mcp and and he was flown to the United States in 2011, 12, and 13, back to back. And he was like the first person that taught poi manipulation at Fire Drums. And you could see like the whole shift of the community. Nobody did manipulation. People just mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden people started doing manipulation. And he was like the first that I saw did like double fish tails with poi 2011 and like three poi, three poi juggling. Ronan was also juggling poi at that time. And I, I had dreams of juggling poi, and I actually did juggle poi too. Like Fred, I love to hear that because I, I don't think I've seen a video of you juggling poi, and I was Very going rare. to at some point on this podcast bring up the fact that yeah. uh, with your club juggling control, 
I would like to see you spin or juggle three points sometime. Yeah. But I did, I I, did uh, do like a couple months, a <laughs> couple months of juggling point. I got like a couple like no beats, but then at that time we we shifted or I shifted. So yeah, time. that's a perfect segue into our our next uh, topic because this is a poi podcast. But uh, let's talk about <laughs> club juggling for a minute. When did you start club juggling? Was it in 2012 ish? It was 2012 too, and the main reason was. Um, I think there's like a few things that happened there. I think one was you could see a lot of like the heavy hitters, like very technical poi spinners at that time. There's a lot of us that shifted over to clubs because three poi was kind of getting popular. And three clubs is easier than three poi. That's just a fact. Like, I mean, you can't really deny that. Like, like three poi is actually really hard. And so like, I feel a lot of us that shifted with two, three clubs had this mentality of like, Oh, if we spend the same amount of time with three point and three clubs, we probably could explore a little bit more things to play with three clubs. And so a lot of us shifted. And then absolutely that was one of the my kind of like thought process. And I feel like I've talked about this with other people. They've also agreed. Mm-hmm. And the second, the main thing was Keith though. Keith and Ronan stayed in my place um 2012. And I was really excited to spend time with them and to learn about their history and 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 tricks and way of like kind of like practice Mm -hmm. and keith at that time was known for his poi like three poi you know freestyle poi and he brought up i remember that night very vividly it was a night it was nighttime and he pulled out three pirouettes and he started juggling in my living room and 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 i watched that and i was like that is not juggling I, I, I don't get that is not juggling. I was like, what is happening? Like, tell me everything. What what clubs are those? What are what the hell are you doing? That is not juggling. Just 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 tell me. It was the coolest. If if anybody has seen Keith in real life, they can also like I, I feel like agree and tell you like if you ever met Keith at that time too, it was such a groundbreaking like technique and, and time period in that kind of like style. And it was so beautiful, and 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 I decided, okay, I was gonna start doing three clubs. At that point, I was already doing two clubs. I, I saw this other guy, uh, interesting, Valerie at uh, Fire Drums. So when I was at my first Fire Drums, I also picked up two clubs, and I only wanted to swing clubs and um, do fish tails and manipulation. So I never really wanted to juggle three clubs. And everywhere I went, people would be like, where's your third club? I was like, I don't have a third club. I yeah. have two clubs. <laughs> and they were like, look at me all weird. And That's I mean, amazing. There is beauty to that. So I had, I really had the time to like work on the fundamentals of the club before like going into three clubs. So by the time I went, it's like glow string into poi. You know what I mean? Like I already had the sure. fundamental and going to poi was like kind of like a shortcut. So same with the clubs. I was already working with two clubs for two years. Before I went to three clubs, by the time I hit three clubs, I was already familiar with the clubs. And so Keith basically told me he learned from this guy, Sam. And uh, his name is Sam Yude from Bristol. And one of the best three club like manipulators, I think, out there at that time. And um, and after he told me all the stories about Sam, I was like, well, that's like my mission. I will travel to Europe and I will find this Sam guy. And that's how I started juggling three clubs. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about Sam because we have talked about this uh, offline before in person, and it was funny. The story when you were telling me this story, I was just felt very uh, happy to be hearing it from you directly. So uh, tell us more about Sam. Definitely, uh, I think like for my closest circles, like people around me, I think if you're like really close as my close friends, you usually would know me talking about Sam and Mikkel. And this that's and Bash. Those are like the main names that I kind of like has like pushed me into like the club juggling world. Sam, I don't know him personally. I do know Bash. I do know Mikael. Uh Sam, he's an interesting guy. I think there's like a lot of controversy around him. Uh he I all I know that he's he's from Bristol. He's been juggling forever. He's like a kind of like a break dancer, b-boy kind of guy, he's a really good yeah. dancer. And in the last at that time in 2012 13 he was already like developing a lot of like three club manipulation tricks and keith basically took those tricks and came to the us and kind of like shared it so a lot like a lot of the manipulation that you see here in the us with three clubs a big percentage of that i guess comes back to sam 
So it depends mm-hmm. on your research, you know. And so Sam, I think uh, the controversy that goes around him is that he, from what I know, so I don't know him personally, so this is only from my research, that he mm-hmm. is very protective of his tricks. It's kind of like almost like, a, I guess, a magician, like a like magician's culture. Because the difference between juggling and magic in my head is like, I've been to, I've taught and performed juggling at a magician's like event. And from what I see, magic is about the illusion. Magic is not about the difficulty. Magic is about showing you the magic and not letting you know and keeping that mystery. But once so you know, interesting. Once you know the mystery or the technique, the magic is lost. Right. That is, that is magic. Like, and it doesn't matter how difficult or hard it is. It, that's not the point. That's magic. Juggling is the opposite. Juggling is like. I will show you the technique and show you how hard this is and you will be impressed by the difficulty and that mm, is juggling. Mm. And so I feel like club manipulation for me kind of like can f- can be in between those two. There's magic, there's juggling, it's in between. It can it can float around in the like in the middle because there's some stuff in club manipulation that is not that hard, but visually it's like whoa, it's crazy. And then I think there is like a little bit of like cultural thing where like these club manipulators, I guess it depends if you go to Europe too, because they, they treat their craft like a performance piece. So they don't want mm-hmm. to like share all the IP, the intellectual property sometimes. <laughs> and, and so there's I also, love that. There's like also a debate about that as well. And so like, and Sam, I think he doesn't want to share all his stuff because I guess it's his research, you know? And, and but yeah, that's Sam, like, I did go to Europe. I did try to like chase him down and I did see a little bit. I have, I've never seen his full. And here's the thing about juggling as we all of all of us, we all know, like when we're on stage and performing, we're not fully doing everything we can, but sure. when we're practicing in a gym or like at a park or whatever, we can really push the boundaries and see and try things that we can't do. And so like when we're, you want to catch like, a manipulator or juggler or spinner at in their most natural state, which is when they're practicing. And mm-hmm. when you get to see that, that's that's magic. You know? Well yeah, I mean even when I'm in the studio, it's sometimes a little bit uncomfortable for me to be trying new things around people who don't sure. know me very personally. Sure. So that's why I've always had a problem practicing in public spaces. And I know it's just a mindset of just pretend that they're not there and just focus on what you're doing. But that's so hard to do because you, you want to show people the things that you've already accomplished and the things that you're already good at and dropping, you know, 10 times per every couple minutes or whatever is very discouraging. And it Mm -hmm. makes, it just makes me feel bad for anybody that's watching me. And so I think it kind of goes into that when you trust somebody enough to be uh, able to try the things that you're not comfortable with, around them and drop and show them this is what I'm working on. I feel like there's a level of comfort associated with that. For sure. So when you started club juggling, how long do you think it had been until you completely put all of your effort and focus into club juggling versus poi? So in 2012, I started juggling. I was still doing poi a little bit. And then the year after I went to Europe, um and to to ejc the european juggling convention and that year it was in france and that was basically that was it the nail in the coffin so like i went Mm -hmm. to europe for the first time my 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 mission was to like find sam and i got to see (laughs) like that's a goal (laughs) yeah i know i just wanted to see like (laughs) this guy blow my mind yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. i want my mind to be so blown that i could bring it back and then so i went to europe (laughs) Um, I went to like five countries and we were at EJC and I got to see like, I got to like immerse myself in the European community for the first time and really got to see like a lot of, a lot of beautiful, beautiful skills and, and things and people that have been dedicating like 20, 30 years of their life to the craft, you know? And, and I also, I met Mikel. I think Mikel, I was there to like find Sam and then I met Mikel and Mikel Ayala is like a fishtail, like master club fishtail, like. Th- uh, three clubs, two clubs, uh, anti spins. Like, uh, if you have heard his name, people would say like he's like one of the most beautiful jugglers out there. 
Mikhail's also kind of like a mystery guy. And after I saw him practice in the gym at five in the morning, um, it was easily one of the most beautiful hours of my life. And I came back and by that time, so if you look at glow stringing, I was practicing maybe like an hour a day, you know, like, and then I did poi, poi, maybe I was practicing like two hours a day, like every day. And okay. Then af after I came back from Europe and after I saw these guys and saw Mikel, I was practicing three to seven hours a day, seven days a week wow. for about with clubs, with clubs for about like seven years or so. Like, like, how? yeah, like I, like every, like it was so burned in my brain that like when I wake up in the morning, it's like the first thing I think about. And that's the only thing I can think about until I go to bed. That was my whole existence for about even, like, even like dreaming about it and stuff. I feel that. You I know. dream about I dream about tricks sometimes, but when it's mostly when I'm awake. When I'm awake, I just think about the memories that I and things that I saw and how beautiful it was that it moved me in a way where like when you watch like a performance, you're like tearing up and like it's mm. just like it it was such a beautiful way of life and I wanted to feel how that felt like. And so I was like chasing the dragon, you know. Like it, well, yeah, and I mean it's really for people that put their life towards something like that it's beautiful for us to see somebody else who is also committed not just so much time and hard work but if you really think about it it's a percentage of our life totally it's dedicated towards this art so it is more sentimental in a lot of ways to see and understand how difficult some of these patterns that we achieve are to sure. do and, because and not many people life. and the, not many people can say that you know like whatever craft or like pursuement they have like not a lot of people can say like oh i've pursued this for like like ten thousand hours you know like mm -hmm. and not only that also i feel like because the world is such a difficult life can be so difficult especially like with family and and finances and like you know getting older and health and so like a lot of people everybody we're here to survive you know and survival can be really hard at times and to be able to pursue something that is outside of survival like outside of making money you know like it's like it's so beautiful it is it is sure. so beautiful because it's, if i feel like the love is so pure you know and it's like it's very beautiful to see and it's something I, mm -hmm. something i've always sorry to cut you off something i've always felt about poi is it was just always there for me so mm -hmm. All through all the bullshit that you were just barely talking about life and surviving and everything like that poi was always there for me throughout the good times and the bad times and if i wanted to take my mind off life and everything else that was happening around me i i could always rely on my prop and just kind of going into my own space and area and mm -hmm. i'm sure that you really felt that so much more with club juggling because the sky is the limit with with club juggling in a lot of ways the sky is the limit. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Poi is awesome. We're on the Poi podcast. Poi is awesome. I've I've taken a break from Poi for that long, and I'm recently starting getting into Poi. But clubs, I think, is they're all different, right? The feeling is different, and I think clubs scratches your brain in a very specific way. And I do know, like you know, like in America and U.S., like a lot of people, are like, oh, I'm diagnosed with ADHD, diagnosed with ADD. I feel like club is super ADD because it's like it doesn't it can't even decide what it wants to be and it scratches <laughs> your brain at the right spot like you know what I mean and it's like for people that are like that it's like that's what clubs are <laughs> that's so good so yeah you you had just mentioned kind of getting a spark back recently for Poi and obviously you're on a Poi podcast so like you have deep love for it and you always will how did you start getting the want to spin poi again where did you that know, ha how did that happen i really never thought i would come back to poi really like because i feel like it's just clubs just like it just hits the right spot is enough for me you know and i could pursue it like life lifelong you know even with one club or whatever but then recently i think it has been like maybe like two years ago i i i started streaming on twitch and and i would like pull out these videos and talk about videos and i started watch and that that's when i saw start seeing your stuff like about two years ago and then i start seeing uh the flow and fire kids and i, I really like that guy nate his stuff and alan 
yeah nate, nate uh, allen i think yeah. it's a nate innate poi on instagram for yeah for the yeah yeah, yeah. Yep. so yeah I'm, it's funny that you say nate nate's actually going to be the next guest on the podcast as oh, well cool. as he is the person that inspired me to start three poi and i had seen cool. a lot of people do three poi well i wouldn't say a lot that had that were expert level control with three poi because three poi was in its infancy for a long time there were people that were pursuing it and learning things about it, but the large part of it was movements that were not very clean. And it's mm -hmm. just the truth. We it's were hard. learning about three poi and yeah. I never, I say? never saw somebody do three poi that made me be like, Oh, I'm going to start it. I mean, like mm -hmm. I want to start three poi now because I saw that video, even going back to, um, to some of the people that were really spearheading the three point movement, such as Jonathan Alvarez, like the, the three point performance that kind of sparked a lot of the three point movement. Even back then I didn't want to start three ploy, but something eventually clicked and I saw Nate's uh, Nate Allen's video. And I actually, the way that he was spinning three ploy inspired me to start. And I had been watching his videos and then I got a set of three ploy and I'd been spinning three ploy. And then I saw that Nate Allen was actually located in Ogden, Utah, which I lived in Salt Lake City at that time. So it was just very crazy for me to realize that he was in the same region as me. And me and Nate linked up and he taught me how to do my first three poi tricks. So yeah, like that, that's awesome that you bring up Nate because it's very intertwined to my story as well. That's cool. And after I, I start seeing like what you were doing and I was watching like Nate and because I feel like Poi has gone through such a shift in the last as long as I've been around like 15 years from long Poi to short Poi to toroids to contact Poi mm -hmm. to three Poi like kind of like just the trend of Poi like what's like kind of like trending like changes and for many of those years I didn't really feel like it appealed to me or the direction that it went. And then what I like about what you're doing and Nate's doing and some of the newer kids doing, like like even I've been like watching like Levi's stuff recently too. And, yeah. and I think it's bringing back the classic look with the longer poi, but adding the newer stuff, like with the gunslingers. And gunslingers are not that new, but it's like still newer than the classical poi. So I feel like sure. the classic versus the new and the long, the length of the poi has kind of like gone longer and it really looks good to me. And I was like, that looks good. It like, you know, and and then so I started like learning gunslingers like a year, a year ish ago. And <laughs> that's and now, so crazy. You make them look so good. <laughs> and now, of course, as you do. <laughs> and now I'm kind of like getting back into poi, and 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 it's 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 different. It's definitely different from clubs, but it feels good when I do it still, even with the two poi and and learning some new stuff here and there. And uh, yeah, that's yeah. So and you know, I think long poi they look so good because you're embracing the beautiful parts about poi about the extended like the actual figure of poi so when mm. i i'm about to get a longer set of juggling because oh, although it boy. might be well my juggling set right now is about 24.5 but okay. i'm about to go to 26 maybe 26 and a half be, for juggling yeah. Because yeah, it's really not that much harder to juggle longer poi. It is more difficult, but it looks so good. Just the extra couple inches is just like, wow, that I looks a, so much better. I have a better. story for you. I have a story yeah. for you. Yeah. So I started with like 22 inches or 23, like <laughs> freaking long time ago. Like really short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I got up to like 24. And then, and Ronan, again, come back to Ronan. Ronan is like my number one poi spinner. Like, and I was hanging out with him at Kinetic. This was like 2012, and we're like sitting by the fire circle. Me and him, we're like kicking in, chilling, and and I was like, "Hey, Ronan, you should like spin some poi." And he was like, "Oh, I left my uh, poi at the cabin." And Ronan is like six one, six feet. He's tall. He's a tall guy. And I was like, "You can use my poi here. Why don't you use my poi?" And he's like, "So You're nice. 22 inch like, poi. 24, I think 24, 23, <laughs> sorry, sorry, 20, sorry. 23. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, 22 would be really funny. But yeah, I was like, I like 24. And then he was like, he was like so nice. He was like, yeah, I'll, I'll spin your poi. So he picks up my poi. He goes into the fire circle. I'm watching him. And I swear, Ronan is like master. Like every time Ronan spins, I have to stop and watch. You know what I mean? Like it's like a, a master in there, like, like their craft. You have to like just take it and, and appreciate the beauty of it. So he goes up, he spins. I watch him. He comes down. 
and it was like the first time I wasn't impressed. I was like, what? What was it? What? Why? What? What? What, what went wrong? And I was thinking, <laughs> it's Ronan. It's like master. Like it must be my boy. It has to be. It has to be my boy. And then I had this realization. It was my boy. Because, <laughs> because he was so tall. And his style really like accentuates the, the grace of it. And because that one or two inches or a couple inches off, it completely was a different spin. And to me, after that, I went up to 26. And like I do know like a lot of people will like run into me at events and stuff and they want me to spin poi. If I don't have my 26 and if I don't have my poi, I'm not going to spin. I'm sorry. Because it's like, I rarely spin poi to begin with. And if I want to spin, I want to make it count. And if I don't have my like set and my 26s, I'm sorry. I'm just not going to spin just for I love shit, that. shits and giggles. I love that. <laughs> I, I need to take that approach because I've spun poi that were, these specs were, I'm sorry, folks, atrocious. And uh, I'll just, my two poi set is actually 28 inches for a contact. Oh, wow. That's long. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not an extremely tall guy, but um, something that I, again, going back to the length, the overall look and the aesthetic of longer poi accentuates style. And you can, if you need to shorten them, you can just wrap yeah. them around your hands and make them shorter. And although mm -hmm. shorter poi can be more versatile at times, longer poi just are overall, there's more possible because you can always shorten your poi. You can't make them longer. Definitely. But you again, know? again, though, like, whether it is long poi or short poi or whatever, like in the end, also like I think one of the other important parts aspects of this is like it's you get, just gotta have fun, really. Even if it's like twenty inch poi or whatever, if that floats your boat and that's yeah. really like a kick 20. and you're like all amped, yeah, do yeah, it, yeah. do it. You know what yeah, I mean? yeah, because there yeah. are style specialists and there are these really pocket spinners that will focus towards one style or one idea if very hard um whether somebody's obsessed with doing like i know a guy that is obsessed with doing only fishtail everything mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he is just stays heavy on the fishtails uh mm -hmm. jack boynton um for those who know oh, i yeah. don't know his, I, his... I ran into him a couple times at burning man. It's, fun, it's so funny i ran into him at burning man this last year he like walked up to me i was watching him spin and i couldn't recognize him because he cut off his hair and oh yeah he, he did yeah he walked up to me and he was like you remember me and i was like looking at him, I was like, uh, not really and he was like i met you at gem and gem in like 2019 and i was like, i couldn't recognize him but i was watching him spin and i was like man this guy's good and then i ran it ran to him again uh, a couple weeks ago at gem and gem and uh i was like yeah that guy <laughs> i saw him do a a fishtail anti-spin fountain you guys for those of you who know what that is and can picture that that is so ridiculous, preposterous, in fact. I, I just, yeah. So this man has taken fishtails to a level that is just incredible. So like like I was saying, there are these very pocket type spinners that will always appreciate kind of the tech that you're bringing and what you're pursuing. Even on a very intricate and technical level, they very much appreciate that. So Jack is a great example of that for, for sure. Because sure. I also like getting older, I feel like... For me, I, I feel like as I get older and being ar around the game for so long, I think like the one word that I kind of keep in mind a lot is impermanence. So all of this will be gone. You and I, the podcast, the spinning, the juggling. And so like the important thing is to kind of like enjoy it, right? And not let other people like constrict you in like exploring. And if, it, if it's like a 20-inch poi, whatever, or clubs, one club, three clubs, two poi, no poi, whatever. Whatever floats your boat, do it. Yeah, it's all That's the cool part about full arts is because there are all these very unique people that do their own things and they bring their own things to the table and it's very much so the true form of art where it's very uh subjective in a lot of ways mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i prefer this style i prefer long poi short poi fast mm -hmm. slow yeah, yeah. so it, it all very much intertwines um who are some of your favorite flow artists right now Right now, 
like are you talking about like newer people or just like in general like, for we'll say like kind of just going back to your spark uh with poi in the last couple of years uh, after your club juggling hiatus i will say because you're always going to be a poi spinner um <laughs> who are some of the artists that you kind of came back to the scene and and uh were impressed with kind of like the way that they've progressed poi since you had left i'll say that I mean, Ashley, I met Ashley Galliford in like 2014 at uh, Art Outside. They flew me outside, uh, flew me out there to like, like teach and stuff. And I, I got to like meet her and she was just like starting to spin. And she was telling me like how like stoked she was to like meet me and we became, we became friends uh, since then. And she's, uh, she's been coming along well, like, I mean, beautiful stuff. Like Ashley like, is one of my favorite uh, poi spinners. It yeah period so it's funny I, I was making my top 10 list i ended up not releasing this publicly but i just wanted to make a list for almost memorabilia sake if not for to release but ashley was in my top 10 and it's because i very much so identify with her style and the mm -hmm. way that she's incorporating contact into manipulations into these body tracers type type uh stuff that she's doing because I love contact poi and I'm also a fan of the traditional style mm -hmm. of like the Russian style for body manipulations and all that good stuff. But she's very much so just making her own thing. It's a smorgasbord of different styles put in together into what she really likes. So for sure. yeah, I, actually, I, that's I'm so glad that you mentioned her. That's great. I also love uh, David ML. I've never met him. I just saw his stuff recently too in the last couple year or two. The French poi spinner, and I really like. Is it David ML? Is that is yeah that, on Instagram? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah the I double meteor the as double of late. Meteor. He's yeah. been yeah. killing the double yeah. meteor game for sure. Yeah, like he's I've been too. following David and Ashley for several years at this point. So it's it's mm -hmm. great to hear you mention them because they're both killing the game for sure. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Yeah. I like I love your stuff too. I mean, you've been been shredding it and and i remember like watching like you guys and i was like oh this is like this is what like the new kids are doing these days huh <laughs> yeah with contact yeah i i went into a really big contact boy phase for many years of my life and almost to the point where i stopped learning any other patterns that were outside of contact or tosses for quite a few years i didn't learn another pattern that i could do with fire poi that i was not grabbing the actual wick for for many years i mean to be honest i've kind of gone back to the flower pattern based style uh as of late just because i, I was like wow i've been really neglecting my actual two poi fire style for many years now because i just don't do the contact uh do on do, fire do you do any other like contact things like contact juggling or contact staff do you do any of those no no, I feel like, I'm I feel, like, I feel like you can get it. I feel like I can see you get into it. It's like I know, I know. I see dragon staff and contact juggling um on occasion and I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. Especially some of the artists. I have one local artist that I've just been absolutely um mind blown by recently. He's a staff spinner, but he does double staff and he has like a Muay Thai background and he's just been doing all this really cool stuff with staffs and he doesn't have an Instagram or anything. I wish I would, I could plug him, but this will be the motivation for him to get an Instagram because he's an incredible artist. Um, he's one of the people that's inspired me to start other types of contact juggling, but it's just been primarily poi because I feel like I want to put all my energy into one prop and not mm. be mediocre at it at multiple for props, sure. but I want sure. to put myself into one thing, you know, mm -hmm, for sure. Do you feel that way in a like a similar way about club juggling, how you just kind of applied yourself uh one hundred percent to club juggling and kind of removed the other distractions from your life to focus on one thing? That's that's what happened in the last many years. But then I've always wanted to clean up my contact juggling and contact staff. And I got like a contact staff from a dark monk that was bought uh for me on my Twitch stream. And then the contact juggling where is it? I have a yeah, one twenty five millimeter uh, J nine, Mister Babash, and that's kind of like inspired <laughs> by a surreal uh, human. Yes. Oh my gosh, it's funny that you bring him up because I, when you brought up contact juggling, that was my first thought. Was yeah, yeah I, surreal is think, a contact I think juggler. Surreal human. For those that maybe you never heard of him, or if you're like new to the scene or whatever, I think he is the most influential flow artist on America 
in our like timeline. For me, he is the most influential play spinner yeah. for, in my life. Um, absolutely, people that know uh, and seen my early interview, um, they asked me about my my most inspired artists or the artist that pushed me the most, and mm-hmm. Cyril was absolutely the guy. So yeah, yeah, yes. it's amazing that you bring him up as well. So ahead of his time, I mean, and I very like, much so. Oh my it's, gosh, it's funny. His play spinning for me didn't didn't do it for me. Like I was watching his play spinning, it was like so technical and so ahead. It really didn't like touch me the like the same way that Ronan and the other play spinners, like Thomas uh, Johansson as well, like from back in the day. Maybe I started from a different time, but then I got to like see his contact juggling, and I got to like hang out with him. At uh, so Bash, he throws this thing called Manips Week, and it's like usually a week or two weeks long, either before or after EJC. And he invites his like 15 of his like best friends, and it's like the highest level of people that have been around for two weeks. And we just like live in under the circus tent. And I got to like see, <laughs> we got to hang out surreal. And he would wake up and he would just kind of like roll around on the ground. And I was just like watching him while a, bo- a ball is on him. He's like doing like splits and like tumbling. And then the ball was just on him the whole time on his head or on his body. And I was watching him and I was like, oh my God, I get it now. <laughs> I was like, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I get it. Now. There was a video. I wish I could remember who put this out. I'm gonna have to just link it or put it out eventually. But there's a video where this guy has a contact ball on him. He wakes up, and the contact ball is on his head. And then he like gets up and goes about his daily life, getting oh, dressed and all this stuff with with there, the con- Do you Juan, remember who I'm talking about? Is a uh, Juan Duarte. Uh, oh my gosh! What from, a guy. Uh, he's from uh, Uruguay. <laughs> And uh, it was crazy that he was also at the the thing. So that's the thing. You go to like EJC, usually it's like anywhere from three to like 7,000 people from like 50 countries. And like, I mean, and uh, yeah, I was thinking so about going cool. next year, but then I, I was thinking about going next year because next year is in Portugal and I haven't been since 2017, the last time I went in Poland. But then I was like, I, I kind of like need to like visit my family from Malaysia because I grew up mm-hmm. there as well. So I don't know. We'll see, we'll see what happens next year. But Yeah, it's funny you bring up EJC. I feel that I want to go so badly, but I feel like a juggling fraud because I'm just a poor <laughs> juggler. And I just That's don't how I know. felt. That's how yeah. I felt my first year. And then I came Did back you? and became a club juggler. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's not going to happen. Poi <laughs> juggling and three poi and poi in general is not losing another goddamn icon because I'm, I'm going to stick EJC, it though, out. But at EJC, <laughs> there is like, imagine like a fire festival, like fire drops, like kinetic fire. EJC is so big, they have like a dedicated fire festival, a fire circle in the event. And so there's like a whole hundreds and hundreds of people that spin and juggle poi and spin fire outside of the juggling outside of the juggling for sure yeah. for sure i just i want to get bo- uh, better at poi juggling before i go even mm-hmm. though i'm always gonna feel like that but whatever so um transitioning into a new topic i feel that i had we had already a little bit covered this but um i'm starting a segment on the podcast that i have fans write in and ask questions to me on instagram to ask oh, the cool. guests live Hell, so that's awesome <laughs> yeah i think it's really fun so that's awesome Alexander Nikishin, I hope I'm saying that correctly, a.k.a. Zesty Flamingo, wrote in asking, in what ways have you seen the poi community and flow arts community change since you were fresh on the scene? And this could be tech. This could be whatever you would like it to be as far as like, um, you know, I- I- anything that you can think of. The, the main one that I think can think of, it's, it's, it, it's both a pro and a con. I feel like the community... For example, compared to like like 10 years ago or something like that, it was like the community was smaller, right? So like the community had less people. And so the dedicated people that were really into the game were like really connected with each other. So you go to like Burning Man and there'll be like two, three hundred of us. Like I, I'll know every single person by name and we will like disperse and then meet up at the fire circle. And it was like really fun. It was like it felt like really connected as a community, like like a family, you know. And I think that definitely has changed. Um, there's more and there's so many people that spin now. You go on Instagram, there's like tons, thousands even. And, and Burning Man, there's so many people that spin fire, which in, in one way, cool and good because other people get to uh, experience the magic, you know, and get to experience right. the, 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 the fun and all that stuff. The downside to that 
I think it's just like inevitable because when there's more people, there's less people connected, right? Because you can't know everybody. And so you go to these events at Burning Man, there's a lot of spinners, but I think they're kind of like, they don't know each other. Like nobody knows right. each other. There's, there's right, pockets of people that know each other, of course, but then it's more like, I don't want to use the word diluted, but it's like the connection is like more diluted. But that doesn't mean that they're not having fun. They're probably has, they're having as much fun as I did or having the, like the time of their life, you know? Like in, right. And so I think that's kind of like, one of the big change that I've seen <clears throat> in the last decade or so. Well, yeah, again, going back to my point of community no longer being defined by your geographical location, but what are you into? And the internet has a lot of ways popularized that um, you're going to sure. be getting people all from all over the world in different types of cultures and that view things differently. Some people don't even understand the term flow arts now and they're mm -hmm. doing poi so it's just interesting to see the type of change that there's been culturally because people are in it for different reasons now some yeah, people sure. are really into the, the side of poi where it's like i just do it to feel good and sure. i actually enjoy being in a flow state whereas some people will approach poi in a very methodical and technical way where they're just drilling one move or one juggle one pattern over and over and over again for a specific goal in mind whereas flow typically is just based around what do you think feels good what do you want to do it's just very open-ended so it's interesting to see how it's changed but everything used to be so much more connected back then because yeah the community was smaller so it was very much more intimate mm -hmm. and i'm sure it's weird to come back and for their I'm sorry, but there for for there to be somebody that doesn't know who Marvin Ong is nowadays that spin poi that that spins poi is very mind for me. It's just like what you don't know who, like Marvin Ong is like what what is happening here like you know or or someone to not know who Ronan is. It's like the people sure. who put these building blocks on poi and kind of were like spearheading a revolution. Even Keith Marshall, I feel, is not a very popular name nowadays in the poi world which is just so interesting to me because <clears throat> back during that time he was traveling the u.s he didn't he come to the u.s mm -hmm. and he was kind of traveling around doing different flow arts things right around I mean, that time how i think about it is like you know how like in the nba there are like different generations of players and different mm -hmm. years of like jordans and kobe's and like and i think that's what it is it's like Flow arts has of the flow arts community has been around now for like since like the late 90s, so like 20, 30, 20, 20, 20, 20 plus years, 20 plus years. Uh -huh. And I feel uh -huh. like we're seeing like a shift of the generational people and people coming in that are completely new and it's just a lot of history now. It's like more and more history to like kind of like learn. And so not a lot of people learn all this stuff. And sure. especially if you go to like an IJA, an IJA is like the International Juggling Association, which is the based in the United States. And I think this year they're having their 75th uh, or something? 76. 76 years. Wow. Imagine a convention that's like <laughs> oh my God. 76 years, right? And I, I've been to a couple of IJAs and it's pretty cool in a way where like this guy would show up who's like, oh, I, I haven't been here in like 10 years. And then this other guy, oh, I haven't been here in like 20 years. And oh there's all my like gosh. generational people that are like huge gaps. And obviously there are some people that like know each other and have friends and know from back in the day but the gaps become bigger and bigger and bigger and not everybody will know all the 76 years of like Ron ronan's you know or sam you know the poly history the club yeah. history it yeah. gets lost in yeah. the mix there's yeah. so many and, people yeah and then there's definitely like some of the very hardcore dedicated like historians like they write articles and really enjoy that kind of stuff and then there's like the newer people that just not that, just, not that they don't give a shit. They're just newer and there's just a lot. Yeah. Of yeah. Well, and where are you going to learn this? I mean, on a, on an extremely like desolate YouTube video from yeah. 13 years ago, that's yeah. been lost in the algorithm. Like that's why this kind of, <laughs> this kind of like podcast is kind of like, I feel like it's important to, to be kept alive. And then I think like people making this kind of like content online and, talking about like the history and, and and i feel like people that are interested and are are in the scene or in the game when you you're interested in something you listen to it it's you find it interesting to you and so people will listen to this kind of stuff and i think it's important to like keep the culture and history alive by making content like this for sure. well and i've been feeling that i love podcasts and i love 
poi so much and there's no long form discussion on poi. And so I want to mm -hmm. interview people like yourself to kind of find out your background as, a, as well as explore the early days of poi and kind of where it's at now, the hopes for the future, all these good things. I feel that there just needs to be more longer form discussion around the thing that we love because there's thousands of people all across the world that are pursuing this at a high level in the same way that we're pursuing our craft and they're putting their life, a certain percentage of their life dedicated towards boy. And I think it's very cool and there just needs to be more discussion around it. So I'm really glad that you were up to doing this podcast with me. We've been talking about it for months, but um, one more thing that I want to get to before we close out the podcast. Um, you've been a frequenter of Burning Man for so many years now. How many years have you been to Burning Man? Do you remember? Uh, Do you know? Six. You would have to count. <laughs> uh, I don't have to count. I'm very analytical. I have stats <laughs> and my metrics. Like <laughs> Six years I've been. I went 2010, 11, 12, and I skipped, and I started going to Europe. I went to like EJC three times, 13, 15, and 17. And then somehow 2017, I ended up at Burning Man. Um, in 2018, I was gifted uh, some tickets to go because my close friend knew that I was going through like a really rough patch in my life. And that was like the year that I was like transitioning out of doing juggling and floor arts full time. And it was a really dark time. And then this past year, last year, my friend also knew that I was still going through that rough patch. And he gave me $1,000 as a gift. And it was like, claim your destiny. And I was like, break my arm. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and i'm going and uh it was my sixth and i was really surprised how cathartic it was and how much fun i had and how much i was able to like break through the jadedness and here's the thing is when you like travel i've been to like 22 countries i've been around the world three times i've been to like over hundreds of like flow and juggling events and i've seen shows and and once you consume so much, sometimes it's hard to like, like feel new and excited again because you analyze the memories that you have and you you have to study like, like the monkey brain wants to like analyze the memories and and this Burning Man was really huge for me. I really broke through that, and I'll again, be, again, yeah, and really yeah. surprised myself that. Wow, I'm like so old and jade. I, I was walking around. The park <laughs> You're not so old. Get out of here. I look super young, but I'm like, <laughs> oh I'm my like, god, like my thirties. I'm like my last year of my thirties, and I'm walking around the fire circle, and I'm like, dude, I'm like a fire spinning elder here. What the hell? You are an elder. God damn it, it's amazing. <laughs> and then, and then, but I was able to like break through like the jadedness and the monkey brain, and I was able to really like. Um, and, and, and yeah, I, I, I'll love to tell the story. So like, so I went to, the, it was my sixth Burning Man and we brought a couple like virgins with us, uh, this guy Loretta and Phil and and we like ran to like Mason and, and some of these people that are going for the first year and they're, they were like, they were mind blown. They were like, oh my God, this is amazing. Burning this, Man. This, 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 should be, this should be happening everywhere in the world and like <laughs> all this stuff, you know? Like, and I'm like, mm, yeah, cool. Uh, I, I thought about that like, like what like 12 years ago i've 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 seen that one i've seen this one i've i've seen oh yeah i've seen that guy i know that guy and it's like like i was walking around with them and their like minds are like getting melted and i'm like yeah it's cool you know it's it's burning man well and it <laughs> goes back to what we were talking about earlier <laughs> with the story of sam is kind of the ma uh -huh. the magic behind all of it and kind of the more experience that you get and the more times that you've seen whether it be a trick or in Burning Man's case, like an art exhibit or, right. you know, what have you, it just kind of over time, it does lose its magic in a lot of totally. ways. And you, once you understand it. And then, so I walk around and then I was asking myself, why am I not feeling like them? What's missing with me? Like, I want to feel what they're feeling, but I'm not. And I was like analyzing why that is. And then I came to the conclusion that it was me, myself, stopping myself. My brain I'm a very analytical person. I'm always calculating, like I'm always calculating the wind. I'm calculating the humidity. I'm calculating the prop. I'm calculating the technique. I'm watching that person spin. I'm always comparing left and right and all the stuff mm -hmm. that I've seen to kind of want to figure out where do I stand in this moment to, to see like, is this like my high or low to where to figure out where I am in my life. And so like, I like to, 
I, not that I like, I automatically do that. And for those that relate, maybe you can relate how it feels. And then I realized that is actually stopping me from being happy. I started tearing up like once I realized that. I realized that it wasn't my fault. It was my default state and it was stopping me from being happy. And then a few days later, Wednesday night rolls by, everybody was asleep. I was like, it was the only time I was by myself. And I was like, I'm going to go out by myself. I'm just going to roll around because I usually go in a group. Mm -hmm. I go out and I ran to like uh, this uh, Flo Mamba, my Flo child. Oh like, my God, that's so cool. So, I know who that is. That's because great. there's like, I don't know if you guys know about like rave dads. If a person brings you to the rave, they're your <laughs> rave daddy. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. start you spinning your, your Flo dad and you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm his uh, Flo dad, you know, like I, I picked him up at a mansion party years ago. Oh and um, we're close friends. So we're good friends. And he he always talks up to me and and like you know like respects me a lot. And and we're just kind of like hanging out. And but he has such a very different like mentality approach. For me, I'm always like technique cleanness, like small, you know, like work on this like thing. And for him, it's like big fire, big fire. And so like <laughs> we never really I feel like get to like connect, you know. Like and then we were sitting there, and it was Wednesday night. We we're on like uh, uh f like four and eight or something like deep like on the side of the city and we we're talking about just catching up talking about like the struggles of life and he brought his like uh, his dad passed away a couple years ago he brought the ashes to the temple and kind of just talked about like jadedness and just the difficulties of like community and getting older and the struggles of like finances and stuff like that so we really got to like connect on a human level and then he was like it was getting cold and then he was like i'm gonna like spin some fire i was like yeah let's let's spin some fire and so we got up and there was only like maybe like five, six people spinning. He was spinning. Mm -hmm. I spun. And usually I would compare that fire circle. I was like, oh, that fire circle is kind of small. It's kind of like not as epic because sometimes the fire circle can get up to like two, three hundred people and like bump in. And I was like, hey. and then all of a sudden this thing clicked. All of a sudden I was like, wait a second. Like I would usually analyze the fire circle. But then I realized there was quite a special moment because I never really get to connect with him, you know? And that was like the first time I feel like we got to like connect at a, at a deep level. And then I realized, you know what it is? It's no matter, no, no matter the moment, if it's big or small or however it is, you know, like the fire, small fire circle, whatever, every single moment in your life, every different combination of people that you get to experience, like this moment, like where we're talking and stuff, it's like a unique moment in time, in life, in this universe that will most likely never, never, never happen again. And then once I had that like revelation or thought process, I realized that instead of like comparing and analy analyzing those moments, and even I still do, you have to pay respect and all match to that moment because it will pass and it will never come again. And once I had that kind of like thought process boom it was like especially as the years go by and you especially you go, as the years go by yeah you yeah, go yeah. to one festival and go mm -hmm. to the next and you're looking forward to an event for years yeah. or months or whatever and you mm -hmm. go to the event and it's yeah. very it's great in the moment and it's oftentimes hard to appreciate where you're at because sure. um you know like you said kind of going back to the the whole like magic behind like everything yeah. happening you just get to a place where you're almost like accustomed to it. And so I, I'm i very happy to hear that for you because yeah, even so, so it's funny. Um, when we did the Southwest Flow Fest, I got to the event and I was there helping set up and stuff. And uh, I was walking with Ashley Galliford and Amy and Matan and a few others. And he, I saw you walking down the dirt path approaching us. And I was like, damn, dude, that's Marvin Ong in the fucking flesh, dude. Let's go. <laughs> it was dope. It was a good moment for me. So like kind of those uh, those special moments at festivals and whatever. It's It's very cool to relive that and have appreciation for it yeah. while it's happening. Yeah, so that was my that last was such a fun event. Oh my gosh, it was my last Burning Man last year, and I had such a great time. Like I was surprised myself that it was like the closest to the first one, and and this year I'm like ready. I'm like ready to go. I already got confirmed ticket from my uh, camp, um, so I'm heading back out there for the number seven this round. Yeah, 
we have a conclave. I might see you out there. So oh, we'll, we'll have to link <laughs> up. Yeah. We got to together. Hell yeah. Yeah, dude. Um, cool. Well, I mean, we can wrap it up. It's really been a good conversation. And at some point down the line, once we get better um, at running a podcast and we get more developed in our, our uh, YouTube channel, I'd love to have you on just as a kind of once in a 20 guest uh, person sure. to come yeah. on. Because I feel oh like you're a very you. different question. You're a very important guest to the community, and I'm I'm very honored to be able to have you and and talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. And is there yeah. anything else that you any final thoughts? Any any festivals that people can catch you at this year, besides Burning Man? Uh, besides Burning Man, I think I'm going. I think I'm going to Tipper and Friends in Florida. Like, hey, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> <laughs> They just announced the date, May fifth, and I think let's go. I for me to go because Florida, is- Florida homies catch Marvin there. Yeah, Tipper's link getting, up with uh, this man. Tipper's getting older and he has like health issues, so uh, like I don't know how many times he's gonna play, and so I want to like see him. And uh, oh yeah, so besides the festival, you can always catch me on my socials. I'm sure like you'll post uh, post it somewhere. If you're on Discord, I'm on Discord all the time, and uh, if you're on Twitch, hop by and you know chat it up. But yeah. yeah, yeah, for real. And you guys know where to find uh, Marvin, hopefully on several platforms. He's on Twitch, he's on YouTube, you're on Instagram, TikTok. So yeah. got all the platforms, support this man. And I think that pretty much does it, man. Thank you so much for joining us and doing this podcast. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. Cool, that Thank was you. fun. Have a great weekend. Yeah, yeah you too, brother. Bye.